So first of all, I'm Valentin. I've been working in the video game industry for more than 10 years now, out of which about four at Splash Damage in uh, London, United Kingdom. And these are some of the games we've been, uh, we've been making throughout the, throughout the time. Feel free to check them out. What are we going to talk about, about today? We're going to start with some uh, introduction, then I'm, I'm going to give you my motivation, what I did this, and hopefully you'll extract some of your own motivation. Then we're going to get to know a bit the background on shading languages, so to help with getting into the real meat on the bones of this talk, which is the C++ part. And at the end, we're going to have a nice showcase, some really nice like videos and, um, uh, you know, effects to prove the work we've, we've going to show until then. So shaders, what are shaders? Well, apparently there are computer programs that are used to do shading. Fair enough, what's shading? If we look at Wikipedia, it says that it's something about depicting the illusion of 3D by varying the, um, the amounts of light and darkness, right? How about a definition more closer to our domain? Let's go back all the way to 1988 with Pixar who literally wrote a book on this. They, they literally invented the term shader. And for them, it meant a computer program they used to draw something. And you're looking here at a uh, still from um, the very first animated movie called Luxo Jr. That was then. How about, uh, how about now? Well, now we have this beefy GPU card sitting in our desktops or like even our phones. They do amazing computer graphics, image manipulation highly parallel computing, and uh, as we recently discovered, they're very good at mining for cryptocurrency as well. Why on GPU though? You might well know this by now. I'm just gonna quickly reiterate the difference between a CPU and a GPU. So depending on your money, a GPU has a couple of cores, 6, 18, 24, 32, whatever. Whereas a GPU has hundreds of these cores or compute units or whatever the manufacturer calls them, which are perfect at executing a, um, the same instruction over amounts of large amounts of data, thus achieving super huge workloads. Inside the GPU, there's like a logical, sometimes hardware um, pipeline. So as points get into vertices, as those vertices get assembled into triangles, these triangles get uh, rasterized, they get shaded, they get blended and finally uh, on the screen, you get various control at these points. So you can have a vertex shader, a geometry shader, or you can have full control if you forego the graphics part and you just do compute shadings. But we're not going to talk about the compute shading. We're going to concentrate on the pixel or fragment shader, which you can kind of see here an idea, the same geometry, but you vary the, the appearance by varying the material shader. And some of the examples I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show, they're going to be even more restricted in the sense that uh, these materials are procedural, like with maths formulas, rather than like someone, uh, a good artist manufacturing them. Right, so what was my initial motivation going into this? So I wanted to create, I wanted to create real-time effects like this. So believe it or not, this is not a uh, photograph. This is like a full shader that's like handcrafted with maths formulas. The same about this, this lush forest and the, and the mountains. The same, this, this, this temple. These were created by uh, Inuk Hercules, who, who has this shadertoy.com community, where you can have hundreds of these effects. Some amazing, like this one. So I wanted to create graphics like this, but I wanted to create them on more limited devices, like your phone even, or a tablet. Um, because at the time, I had a huge commute and I had to like fill up my time. And in London, um, you know, you, it's hard to unfold a laptop all the time. So I, was, I wanted to, to leverage these unlimited devices. And there's another, a, a more uh, substantial benefit doing it sometimes outside the GPU. So as you can see, something happened to this poor snail. The, his antennas on my home GPU, they have a problem because you're reliant on the quality of the drivers of the manufacturer. And sometimes you want to get ground truth reference, so it's better to do it software. So this kind of gives way to the, to the main takeaway here. We're going to show the work, how you build a library that allows you to take GPU shader code, like some of those examples, a snail, and literally copy paste it 
and have it as C++. So this is not about emulation or like, uh, you know, just in time, something like that. No, you get the code and you run it on C++ and suddenly you can debug, decompile some of those effects, understand how they're made. Um, you can have your own, you can generate, for example, some noise texture that you can then feed to another thing in your pipeline. Or you can suddenly unit test your shaders, something that was like straight to the screen. Now you can prove it a bit and unit test it and we're planning to do something similar in splash damage at my company. Or you can quickly prototype because sometimes going straight to more the more complex, um, you know, uh, DirectX or OpenGL is too much bother. So just having something in C++ to play around with is quite convenient. As an example of this, as a quick showcase, here's that planet effect that I worked for like months. This is again fully procedural on the GPU. It, it requires quite an expensive GPU to run at like this 60 frames per second. Because there's crazy formulas to do those mountains, more crazy formulas to do those um, um, clouds, right? So what we're gonna show is how you can run this and compile on your mobile phone. See, it's like with GCC, it gets compiled and then it runs, obviously way slower. <laughs> but, but at least the power of the compilation is fast enough that you can quickly iterate or like prove some aspects of it. And remember, this is like on a phone, we'll, we'll show later how it behaves on a more, you know, on your desktop PC. All right, so that was a sneak peek. Let's understand the enemy here. Let's understand these uh, shading languages. So again, let's go back in time to Pixar and their first render man shading language. And you can see here at a glance the difference that the red scarf on the left is like just a color because they output their color, whereas on the right, it gets a more substantial shape because they do take into account in the source code there on the right um, normals and light direction and stuff like that. So I hope you can get a, um, a quick peek of like how powerful a shader is, how you can like uh, shape and light. All right, so this evolved throughout the 90s, 2000, and we have now two main competing shading languages that are running on the, on the GPUs. You have GLSL, which comes from Kronos and OpenGL, and you have uh, HLSL, which comes from Microsoft. And then you have slight variations like the, the PlayStation shader language, which is very similar to HLSL. How do they look? Well, from afar, if you can squint, they look, they are very C-like, right? They, they have the whole constructs of C with some differences. You see there on top, GLSL with like varying and on the bottom, some weird comma in the all caps, that's HLSL. This is like how they map their inputs, outputs. Remember that, that um, pipeline I was talking about earlier. Going forward with comparing them, they all have the scalar types, the normal kind of C-like types, but when they come into full power is they have these linear algebra types, the vector and the matrix. They call them differently, but they're the same thing. And also they have, um, you know, more specialized texture sampling image manipulation things. We're not gonna cover those here. We're gonna stay into the, the pure kind of language aspect. Going further, again, C, they allow you to declare all sorts of like types, including arrays, structures as well, but no functions, just like trivial types. Um, they allow um, <clears throat> construction, kind of either with like copy style or like uh, initialize the list style, which obviously C++ supports both. So that's a sneak peek as, uh, to the power that C++ has here. When they differ though, is how do they map out the arguments to functions? So obviously on the GPU, you cannot access the memory or like have references, pointers. So they have these um, attributes called in, out or in out, which roughly kind of map to copy by value, copy by, um, by reference. And additionally, they have const like C. You can mix and match this with various levels of constness. Where they come into power is the, the, the vector. So the vector is um, generic. It can have integer floats, even bools. Who knew that like vector of bool is a bad idea on the GPU as well, not only on the CPU. The matrix is a bit less generic. It has um, only float and doubles. Now, when it gets interesting, because so far it's just some types, some linear algebra types. When it gets interesting is the swizzle. 
which allows you to access the element. So normally it's just arrays, like uh, square brackets zero, so square brackets of one, you access the elements of the vectors. But with the swizzles, you can just name them. And by convention, it's x, y, z if they're uh, positions, RGBA if they're colors, or this weird ST, PQ if they're texture coordinates. When it comes into more power, is how you can mix and match these labels. So I have a vector of four, so RGBA. I can take the first three elements by RGB. I can create a reverse one with like A, B, G, R, stuff like that. I can even, um, you know, construct a vector four out of the two smaller ones. You can even L value assign it to them. Obviously, they need to be unique. You cannot just assign it to dot XX because it will be the same component. So it comes. This mixing and matching is quite powerful. And uh, I'm going to show this later. You're going to see how this ties around. A nice motivation is this is an example of uh, central differences, mapping a function, getting the gradient of the function with uh, central differences, which is a matchy thing. But you see here the, the power is like he only has, um, there's only one vector. And you create a lot of tiny axis differences just by having these swizzles. At the end of the day, it's just syntactic sugar, but it's way more convenient than mapping all these 0, 1, 0, 0, like all the variations by hand. And also, also notice how he, he only takes from that function, that map, only the dot x, which is also quite powerful as well. We're going to return to this to see where this comes into play. All right. Then um, operators, like as you would think, they just go um, you know, linear in, in the, um, across the components or for a matrix is like the mathematical equivalent. All these shading languages also offer like a standard library of functions, your utility functions, your geometry, dot, pro dot product, sorry, cross product and so on and so forth. And again, more specific texture and image sampling stuff. How does the future look like? Well, interestingly enough, very bright because everything is moving from C to C++. So, for example, um, Apple, they move from OpenGL to this metal thing, and their metal shading language is pretty much C14. But it only runs on Apple devices, right? NVIDIA has this CUDA thing, which uh, used to be C, now is C11, but allows you to write shaders only for general purpose computing, not graphics. And HLSL, which was C, now is moving towards like a C98, they will add templates and stuff like that. But it's not, uh, it's not yet released. So let's see how C++ can help us now. So the plan is as follows. We're going to choose one of these shading languages, and we're going to twist C++ into accepting it straight up as the source code. And bonus, with some preprocessor magic, we can turn it back into the shading language. So we'll have one set of um, source code, which potentially can go in three ways. It can be either C++, HLSL, or GLSL. So we need to provide that obligatory preprocessor layer. We will need to provide a vector class with all that swizzle, we need to, all those mix and matching we need to provide. We'll have to provide a matrix class, the operators, and we need to provide all that standard library of functions. Yeah, a lot of work, but it's going to be easy, you'll see. So. We're going to choose GLSL because uh, it's ubiquitous. You have it on the desktop with OpenGL. You have it on the phones with OpenGL ES. You have it on um, um, you know, WebGL uh, online in browsers. Although we're going to concentrate on a, a, on a subset, the more pure language, rather than um, you know, texture vertex, like the, the more the outside of, of the graphics part. So how will this vector look like, the design of it? So obviously, we'll have to templatize it on the type and on the number of components. And on this, we're going to inherit from this base that I'm going to show you a bit later. What else? It has to have a couple of constructors, of course, that zero out the components, or um, you know, just assign the components to a scalar value, or a more complicated variadi constructor that will take any sort of um, combination. I can plug vectors that are smaller, then another scalar, then maybe another vector, mix and match as I please. Then 
it needs to behave like a vector, right? So we need to add the subscript operator, um, all sorts of like unit operator, because once you provide this, then you can have binary operators, and so on and so forth. How does the constructor will look? So the one that, um, obviously the, the main thing here, you don't wanna pay the price at runtime because you know how many components you have. You don't wanna just for loop at runtime. So you wanna do it at compile time, fill as many components as you have. So you do this with this nice static four. And you say, yeah, just zero out the all the elements or just place a random value into them. What is this static four? This is like a technique all the way back to C++ 98, which um, leverages template recursion. So we're gonna have a master definition. We're gonna have this uh, static for class with a operator parents that takes a callable, we're gonna call it, and then we're gonna advance by one. And then when these two begin and end match up, we're just gonna stop by having a terminator null um, function. Right, how about that more complicated constructor? So it has to be variadic, and it has to be constrained a bit, like at least uh, one or two arguments, and if it's one, it better not be the scalar, because remember, we had a more specialized constructor. And inside, what it will actually do, kind of the same thing. You recurse down, eating up all the arguments and doing work with them. So that starts the recurse. First, it calls a convenience function, this constructed index, which places that argument at the desired location, and then goes one step more. And you see it advances with uh, get size, which is just an overloaded. If it's a scalar, just one. If it's a vector, you advance with how many components that vector has. And then, of course, you have to terminate when there's no more arguments by having a null body. Okay, how does that uh, constructed index look? Well, very easy for the scalar type. You just put that value at the position you wanted. A bit more complicated when you wanna assign a subvector. So I have a vector of four, I wanna place a vector two, then another vector two. Um, you just make sure you don't go overboard. And then again, you play the same trick with static four. So here's it in action. I'm constructing a vector of three, a 98, and then another vector two with 99 and 100. And you can see how, kind of like how recursively everything will get filled nicely. Let's have a bit of sanity check because you would think all these layers of like static four and all those like abstractions, you might well pay for them. So um, I put here scanf and printf because nobody wants to use IO streams. Um, <laughs> And also to force the optimizer to, you know, to actually do something. Um, so yeah, with O2, let's see how it looks. Well, it looks very good actually, because all modern compilers can basically see through all those layers of static four and whatever you do, and they will just emit the, the assembly that they need. So this is like perfect. It's no better than, it's almost better as having it by hand. I don't know for what why strange reason, uh, Microsoft Visual Studio decided to have more instructions, which, yeah, indeed, um, which more instructions is not necessarily a bad thing, although in this case it is. <laughs> right, so this is perfect, except it's not in debug. In debug, you are paying for all those layers of abstraction, all those static force, all those things. So. That's the main problem with these libraries. They behave, but in debug, they're unusable because they're too slow. Like you see here, static four, all those lambdas, and again and again, so on. So it gets out of hand. Is, can we have the cake and eat it too? Yes. That may be true, I don't know. <laughs> um, again, yeah, could be. But it's a, um, it's a runtime. The, the idea here would be to have, there's nothing better than um, having the, to guarantee in both cases that you will have this, the p most perfect assembly, right, code gen. 
So we can have the cake and eat it too by using uh, fold expressions from, uh, from C17, which are supported in all major compilers by now. And we're going to use a unary fold. Think of this like a, uh, a sum, like an accumulate. So you have a list of variadic templates, arguments, and you literally go over the plus sign, for example, and you collapse them all to the sum. So using this trick, let's rewrite the vector. Instead of uh, templatizing on the size, we need a variadic type now. We need a variadic number of arguments. So let's map the indices, as you can see there. And this allows us to do a very nice trick with um, just stamping out the expression that we need. So we're going to do that fold over the comma operator, which means effectively repeating it as many times as needed. And you can do the same with the other type of constructors. Just to understand this a bit better, here is the declaration, and here is the, what actually happens. So I have a vector of float, and instead of saying three components, I just map them out, 0, 1, 2. And then you see it's perfect um, assignment, 0, 1, 2. They're just separated by comma, which comma allows us to have nice left to right evaluation and also all side effects are, are um, evaluated before the next comma. So potentially, yeah, to your point, the, the for loop could do it, but this is guaranteed to have only the minimal number of instructions. And also simplifies a lot the, the readability. Look how nice now the other more complex constructor looks. It's more readable. There's no more recursion. It's just I consume the first argument and then dot, 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 if any, continue doing it, so on and so forth. OK, how about that swizzling? Because so far, it's still baby stuff. How do we go about uh, simulating the swizzle? So naively, you would think that you would put you know, everything in a union, the old trick with putting everything in a nameless union. So you have the data. And then you put those labels, X, RGB, whatever. And then you do the same when you have three components, and you do the same when you have four components. You think that's the problem, unanimous, anonymous start and union? No, they're totally permitted, only for some strange reason Visual Studio even now complains, saying no standard. Uh, um, but it's totally standard. The only thing that the standard uh, takes issue with is how do you switch from like .x to .y, for example. Uh, but we're getting away with murder here because it's just trivial types and trivial assignments. So there, there's going to be no problem. So how do we do the most complex swizzle? Of course, we're going to create an additional proxy class that will allow us to map nicely to all those indices and thus create all the possible permutations that uh, the GLSL or HLSL standard has. So again, for three components, we're going to have the array and then, you know, create all these Swizzlers, x, y, z. Then you're going to have all the combination for two components. Then you're going to have the combinations for three components. Then you're going to have the combinations for four components uh, with all the, other, all the other names. Now, this is, looks kind of scary, but it's not, because you can quickly generate a Python or even a C++ program to generate these um, combinations. They're not that many. So you see, for example, um, Z, Y, Z, X is 2, 1, 2, 0, the, the mapping of the, the indices. So this Swizzler class has the, the components. You see T data of N and takes these indices. The only kind of thing this can differ, because for example, you have a vector of 2, but you can construct a vector 4 just by mi multiplying this X. So you can do dot X, 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 X four times, right? The most important thing, it needs to implicitly convert to vector, right? It needs to appear like it's a vector, this swizzle thing. So that's why you create an implicit conversion uh, operator and then assignment as well to go both ways. We leverage the same folding trick, very nice, minimal, absolute minimal assembly. On, on one way, you just go in order. In the other, you just place them as the indices tell you, right? and the, the, say, the other way as well. But we hit a problem immediately. So I have a vector 4. I want to make it out of two swizzles. It's explodes. It's a lot of template problem. 
Because if you remember, the constructor takes a vector, not the swizzle thing. How do you solve it? With another abstraction layer. So you create a DK kind of helper function. And you call that bef before calling your helper. That's just called the equivalent decay on a vector. So vector will decay to itself. It just returns itself. A swizzle will return the necessary vector. And scalar will just forward themselves. They won't do nothing. So once you have that, uh, everything is good. Right. How about operators and functions? So we need to recreate a lot of these uh, utility functions. Let's take, for example, the most well-known one, the dot product, or the inner product of two vectors. So we're going to say a dot that takes two vectors of various dimension, and it will create, it will return a, a scalar. So I'm calling it here with two axes. Geometrically, a dot product is the length of the pro projection of one onto the other. So in this case, because they're perpendicular, it should return zero. All good. A part it doesn't work, again, with the swizzle. It will work if you call it with those vectors, you see? If I go out of the way to 1, 0. If you try to create them with, um, with the swizzles, it will fail. It will say, could not deduce template argument. But we just created all those conversions. Like, why are they not kicking in? What's happening? Because it's just supposed to work out of the box. Well, it turns out that type deduction does not consider those implicit conversions. So what do we do? Well, we can just call ourselves explicitly, right? It's a dot of float, and here, here are the indices, which is super ugly. And it totally defeats the purpose of like having the, the shader code pasteable as C++. Or you can create by hand all the combinations, right? Which is also horrible. Or you can do Sphenatrix, which I'm going to show anyway. <laughs> But before that, there's a very interesting solution. So what about kind of placing it outside of the, the uh, deduced context, which counterintuitively means inside vector itself? So if you take that global function, that dot, and you place it inside vector and you, disc and you make it a friend, an inline friend, which is found by an ADL, argument-dependent lookup, suddenly everything works. Because it kind of understands now that it was part of vector, kind of. So it, uh, it will consider the, the implicit um, conversions. So yes, we can, everything works. Except it doesn't. Because, because <laughs> uh, a lot of shader code in the wild uses stuff like this. So it's like max between two elements which are floats. But I don't want to declare max of floats. I have a max of vectors, like takes the Again, with like the variadic stuff. It constructs the, a new vector out of the maximum components. So I don't have the float. You'd think, sure, there's std mean and max, which could work here. Like, uh, but that's not the point, and you'll have other problems. Also, there are more problems. How about this function? Smooth step, 0, 1, and a vector. This, is, this co tries to constrain the, the vector between 0, 1 by interpolating it uh, in a cubic way. But the problem is we declare this smooth step like scalar type, scalar type, vector. So I only templatized on the vector. The scalar is like a fixed type. So that 0, 1 could be int, could be float, could be anything. So you'll have a million of um, errors like ambiguous operator, ambiguous call here. Right. So how do we fix all this? How to truly have the cake in it too? So the solution is to kind of smartly look over the list of arguments and deduct the most vector type out of it using a technique like uh, std common does. First of all, we need a special trick. We need to make this vec the vector of one, which you never do by hand, needs to be uh, implicitly convertible to and from um, scalar. And then you provide this trace. I'm not going to show here. You provide like some traits that, like, for example, if you have a float, that means a vector 1. If you have a vector 3, that's a vector 3. If you have a swizzle of vector 3, that's a vector 3, and so on and so forth. If you have multiple components, it will kind of guess the most vector type. If you have a vector of 1 and a vector of 2, it will always choose the upper dimension. It will choose a vector 2. OK. So then we say bye to our friends, 
and we go back to having the, those functions, like the dot or the max, we go back and have them uh, global again, like, or static in a uh, utility subclass. And then we create the mother of all forwarding functions. So we will uh, go over this trait we have that gives us the vector twice, one for the return, and then the second type to, to guess which function we need to call. So to see this in action, oh, oh, of course, that's just a generic forwarding function. But uh, see, it's just a generic forwarding function. So we need to stamp out with macros all the names, right? But once we have that, everything works. So just a quick demo here. It, it calls max with those two floats. We do the promote to vector. Two floats, that's a vector of one. So then it knows perfectly to call the max of vector of one. So there will be no more ambiguous problems. It will just work. Okay. So we have the vector, how about the matrix? Now it should be, should be a tad easier because um, we already did the, the bulk of the work. The only problem here is there's two dimensions. So two of these, two of these uh, variadic lists, but you don't know where to stop, right? You cannot have it like here, like a, just a one list. So we introduced another layer of abstraction. We do something like, um, um, I think it's integer sequence or something like that. Just a helper type that wraps these lists of, um, of arguments. So once we have that, we can separate, see the, the columns and the rows and specialize on these over these uh, packs. So again, once we have this, it's fairly easy. It takes a vector type and then some utility, how many of them. And effectively, a matrix is a list of column vectors. Now, why column? Because that's how GLSL chooses to do them, which is a bit counterintuitive, but it's more mathematical. Uh, and you would think it, it hurts cache access, but these are like small two or three elements, or two by two, three by three. So it works. So this is how you declare. You see how you do the vector? The matrix is like a two by two. It's of floats this generic vector I prepared earlier, and then 0, 1, 0, 1. A 3 by 3 would be 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. And then you can mix and match. A 2 by 3 will be 0, 1, 0, 1, 2. Once, once we have this, we can pull again the nice tricks of the folding expressions. So look how easy it is to just fill a, the diagonal of a matrix. And the same idea. Look how easy it is to do that more complicated constructor that takes either um, subvectors or scalars. You just call this constructed index, just making sure, I didn't, I didn't show here, making sure you don't go overboard. All right. If you made sure to, to extract those binary operators into a utility class, we can just recycle them. Um, except multiplication. Multiplication is the harder one because um, it behaves differently. It's the mathematical uh, aspect of it. So you would, uh, you would need to provide all the overloads, like when the vector is on the left, when the vector is on the right, or where there's two matrices. Right. You would think, oh, you're crazy. Why did you do this? Surely there's something out there already. And of course, there is. Clang offers everything, even a vector class. So you can use this attribute, and you can have the GLSL vectors with full swizzling and everything. When I discovered this, I was like, oh my god, I, all my work is done now. But actually, it's quite limited because the way it initializes, it's beyond incredible. You cannot, you cannot use it. And it doesn't have the matrix. It doesn't have the, um, uh, all those utility functions. There's also the, uh, someone mentioned earlier, and there's this standard library, GLM, which does swizzling as well. But it does it super horribly with uh, preprocessor macros. And also, it has this XYZ Com, like function call, so it totally defeats the purpose. There is a better one called CXX Swizzle, my original um, inspiration, but it's slow to debug because it doesn't do the, the folding expression. Right. So uh, let's see some results now after all this C work. You're all bored by now, I think. But not before I make you all graphics programmers in two minutes. 
So I'm going to show you, just to understand the work here, like to put to good use the C++ stuff we, we, we've shown, let's see how shaders are actually written. And I have a nice tutorial courtesy by uh, Reindeer from, uh, from the, the shader toy. So let's see, we want to we wanna draw this uh, scene, which is very basic, but that planet and everything I'm going to show follow the same principle. We're going to draw these spheres in a plane, and we're going to use distant fields. So the main idea is you have a camera and then the screen. And from every pixel, you fire rays into the screen. And hopefully, you will, you will hit something. And how do you do this? How do you find out if you hit something? Well, you use distant fields or sign distant fields, which are a mathematical construct. And it will help you choose the, the intersection. OK, what are these distant fields? They're just a fancy way of uh, ex explaining the distance between uh, two points. So in, in this case, the, it will be the, the distance to the center of that sphere minus the radius of it. Well, the true power is that you can combine various shapes by taking the minimum of these uh, distant fields. So once you have this, once you describe in a fancy um, function all these uh, mathematical formulas to describe the, the distant fields, you can, um, you can start stepping through them. See? So instead of ray tracing, you're, you step into the, into the scene by the amount of vec the sign distance tells you to until either you hit something or you have a, um, a limited number of, uh, you know, 40, 50, 100 iteration, and then you stop because you know you will never hit anything. But this will only give you a um, black and white kind of picture. So how do you do lighting? How do you calculate it? You obviously will need to get the normal to apply like Lambertian diffuse or specular effects. And this is where we come around, see? This is where the, the swizzling comes into play. So for every, uh, for every point, you will try to get the normal calculated via central differences. And this is where that uh, swizzle trick comes into play and allows it to be quite, quite fast. Because normally, otherwise, the normals will have to be provided by someone, like an artist or someone, producing them beforehand. Right. OK, let's show a bit of, uh, of benchmark and showcase. So we're going we're gonna to compare against the, the GPU on uh, 1080p, full HD. Then we're going to compare on the desktop, which is kind of a regular 8-core um, CPU with Visual Studio with all the um, optimizations. And then we're going to try it on the mobile phone, like I showed you. There's a very nice Android app called C4 Droid that allows you to have GCC. Uh, and again, with uh, all fast and um, like optimizations. So we're going to have this very unfair kind of comparison and see, see where we're going. So let's do a, a hello world. This is just cycling a bit of colors. Obviously, we need to drop down the resolution a lot to get some cool numbers. I call it this like stamp size and super stamp size. And on the, on the left, you have the, um, the desktop. And on the right, you have the mobile. Now, interestingly enough, I don't know why MSDC kind of blocks at 100 frames per second, where even GCC on the phone can manage like 500 uh, frames per second just for a very simple scene. OK, so now let's destroy it with a... Uh, with a more complicated example, which back to this planet, right? Which for every pixel, you almost do n squared complexity because you need to do those steps. Remember, I showed you in the distant fields, which are like created with like uh, noise functions. Then you need to do the same for the clouds, which do scattering and all sorts of stuff like that. So as you can imagine, I mean, it takes a quite expensive GPU to run this. You can imagine how it does for the CPU, right? So suddenly you have two FPS. Uh, although if you drop it to, to stamp size, you still get something out of it, which is like about 7 FPS or, or 3 or 4 FPS on, on the phone. These are like super heavy shaders. 
uh, normally depends on the complexity, you will get you will get better performance. Let's see another example that I've created. This is generalizing the uh, um, clouds. I didn't stop. So it's the same idea. You describe these uh, distant fields with noise functions, and then you step into them. Again, the Visual Studio manages about. Uh, it's interesting enough that here Visual Studio and GCC agree on the code generation and they manage to have exactly the same um, frame rate. Let's see one more example of a, of a complicated shader, which is this uh, vinyl record. The idea here was to, to simulate light. It's, it's hard to do those light streaks. You need to do it with something called an isotropic lighting and then model the, the shapes and forms of these, like both the record and the, the tone arm again with those distant fields. This fares a bit better on, uh, like on the PC, on the super stamp size. Oh, yep. Um, yeah, you can get almost 30, 30 frames per second and a bit lower on the, on the mobile. But the idea is they're sufficient enough to kind of, you know, get the point across or like quickly debug or inspect. Don't forget this is C++ code. This is not the GPU shader code that will, you know, have the, the performance. And I'm going to leave you with one last um, shader example. An egg on a bicycle. Because uh, why not? And uh, <laughs> with that, thank you very much. That's my Twitter. You can get the library from here. And check out Splash Damage. Any questions? So, and is it all, is, is, are all your shaders using uh, ray marching for um, all the other things? How yes. How hard is it to interface with something where it's using uh, vertex arrays and other things, like depth buffer and things like that? How would you? Uh, not that hard if you isolate those parts. Like, for example, if you have the full shader and then you have an include that only does the more mathematical stuff, let's say, or the fragment shader only, then you can extract that file and have it in C++ without the nasty, um, you know, vertex stuff. Or you can go more crazy with the um, macro stuff and you can abstract with macros the, the more uh, GPU-specific stuff. Yeah, so it's entirely possible, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's look at it. Do, 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 do. In what way you mean? Um, well, given the more complicated shaders you made, I would expect them to have basically an SSD two uh, equivalent, as in your CPU would be using just the SSD unit to run them. I think with uh, O3, O3 it might do it, actually. That was O fast or O2. Um, this one I think you are referring to. Um, this one, yes. yes. Which is just, it's... Uh, MMX or I don't know what these are or SSC one I think, yeah. Uh, depending on your um, optimizer level, you might you might get better. Uh, yeah. So the question is more for the more complicated shaders, say the planets. Yes. Would you get much more efficient performance given a good artifact driver, or have you not looked into that? I haven't looked into it, but it's interesting. It depends also on the data layout. How would you pack those? Yeah, and. The axis as well, like the swizzles kind of go all over the place, so it might actually hurt you going with this, you see, yeah, with seem too much. Thank you. Uh, hi. So, I'm wondering if uh, using those millions for a vertex labeling, uh, yes. could it cause any problem in designing? So, uh, have you ever seen the, the way you're trying to train out uh, a model that uh, that's ready to take a long time? Uh, no, like I said, the, because they're trivial types, um, so this 10.5 here means that you're supposed to do it with like placement new and some more esoteric stuff, but I think enough people do these kind of tricks with structs that the compiler's kind of caught up and there's, there's no problem, yeah. Because this is, uh, the struct is similar to GLM, do you have a GLM? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes.
well, well, first of all, use my library, right? <laughs> and then, and then I think they go overboard a lot with the generation of those um, unions. Well, I keep them to a very minimum. Like uh, you won't have that many inside, even for vector four. They look quite daunting, but they're not that many. Depends on the size. So I think it's still manageable. I didn't have any any, any problems. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, 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 more questions. Let's put back the egg because that's that's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, what if you wanted to texture sampling? Yeah, anything for that? Yes, yes. I actually didn't cover it here. You can simulate that. So, you, uh, the texture sample in um, in the shaders is just a function call it takes the the um, texture coordinates. So you can do. This is actually an SDL app. So you can create SDL image, you can simulate the texture, like load the texture yourself, and then offer it up to the, to the shader. So yeah, you can, you can totally simulate textures as well, to a certain extent. Thanks. Sorry? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, this, this uh, all these shaders, so this is like uh, 60 frames per second, they're all 60 frames per second on the GPU. 60. 60, yeah. I mean, depending depending on your money. Like, if you have if you have like on this one on this uh, tablet, which has a low GPU, it will be 20, 30 FPS, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, it's decent off, right? And it can go up. That too, yeah. Uh, I didn't run that many benchmarks on the GPU because my idea was to prove on the CPU side. On GPU, then it's a more kind of render graphics thing. Can you think of any system ever how to keep track of the loop of all the, all the pixels? Or? Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. So on the, on the CPU, it literally just goes for every single pixel and executes that shader function. So imagine, um, it's quite amazing that the CPU can do that. Right, because the GPU was born just to do this very thing a lot. Uh, I cheat a bit. Yeah, you're right. And I slice it in like a bit, like four or eight, eight, um, uh, you know, bands. Right. So you you um, um, you can multi-thread a bit on the on the CPU, but like I said, eight, maybe sixteen times. Oh yeah, that's true. But in fairness, they're quite easy. I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't show the source code. But um, you can kind of go and see what the manual says. Like for example, that smooth step is just a um, either a linear or like cubic interpolation. So there's not many ways to do that. So so, just like exactly. So a couple of uh, I don't know where I had this. So it is quite interesting. Yeah. Just by writing by hand those like mean plus dot whatever, you get a almost pixel by pixel um, you know equivalence. Yeah. Let's go back to the egg. It's always fun. <laughs> okay, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>